Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 19th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the lessons we draw from CNBC's recent ranking of Alaska as 50th dead last for business. Second, we explain why we think funding the PCE and the PFD are essentially the same issue. And third, we discuss a slide left out of Senator Von Imhoff's recent presentation on her proposed Aurora plan but that explains everything you need to know about it. And now, let's join Michael. So um, let's uh, let's dive deep into this. I want to get through all three of these things today. And we got three big topics. The first is Alaska as a place to do business, our business ranking. Uh, in the uh, you know across the state and and this headline from CNBC uh, saying that Alaska is in hardcore survival mode uh, and is America's worst state for business in tw- this does not bode well for us right now. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, CNBC, uh, the television channel uh, and internet presence, and it does an annual ranking of states. They do an annual ranking of a lot of things, but one of them is an annual ranking of states, uh, ranking them for uh, uh, their the ability to do business and, and the welcome to do business. Alaska finished dead last, 50th out of the 50 states. Uh, and it's not, it, it's not something Alaska hasn't seen before. Uh, this is the sixth time in the 14 years that the ranking's been done that Alaska has finished uh, last. Now, some people are going to are, are going to say, "Oh, you know, the 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 categories are, are skewed. Alaska never really has a chance. It should have finished 45th um, instead of 50th if uh, if the rankings were done a little bit differently. Maybe, you know, maybe 42nd or 43rd. But the fact is that that Alaska consistently has has ended up in the uh, in in the bottom part of the ranking at least for the last decade, um, and and you know it's just it's just a grind every year we're you know we're it's a race to the bottom um a couple of things about this uh that i think uh are important one is we've been ranked 50th last for business let's look at our let's look at what we're doing for a fiscal plan we are using the fiscal tool permanent fund, pfd cuts we're using the fiscal tool that icer uh the institute of, of social and economic uh, research at the University of Alaska that ICER has told us since 2016 has the quote largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy is worst the worst fiscal tool we can use for the overall Alaska economy. We've been doing that since 2017. We've been doing that now for the last uh, for 2016. We've been doing that now for the last uh, uh, six years. We rank 50th in the nation. Put these two together. We rank 50th in the nation for business, and yet we continue to use the fiscal tool that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. What, you know, what is it about that that people don't get? What is it that, that people don't understand? We're doing this to ourselves. 
it's not like it's not like there's some you know giant force out there in the world right. that that is unfairly uh, attacking Alaska. We are doing it to ourselves using the tool that has the largest adverse impact. The second thing that I think is noteworthy is to look at the top ten. Well, well, what you know what what do these what do these uh, uh, states that are successful uh, have have you know going for them? One is infrastructure. Uh, another is uh, is their educational results. Now we can argue about Alaska's educational results uh, a lot, uh, but that's that's one of the things that you find as a common characteristic that they rank highly uh, in in those two in the top ten. What about their fiscal structure? Uh, well, interestingly enough, the top three all have income taxes. Seven of the top 10 have an income tax. All of the top 10 have a broad, have, have some form of broad-based uh, uh, revenue uh, uh, generation uh, th uh, that, that uh, generates revenue for the state, either uh, income tax or a sales tax. Some states have both. But all of the top 10 have some form of broad-based revenue. None of them are relying on the tool that, that has the largest adverse impact on uh, their overall economy. Of the seven that use uh, income taxes, uh, I, think it's, I, think, I think it's worthy to note that three of those use flat taxes, uh, the, the sort of tax that, uh, that you and I have, have discussed on the show before. The top three, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and Utah, uh, use income taxes. Uh, uh, two of those three are flat tax, North Carolina uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Utah uh, use flat taxes. So it's, it's a part, a, a, a not insubstantial part of this is, is to sort of look at how are the states funding themselves, how are they funding their infrastructure, and how are they funding their education systems, which are a big part uh, of their success, and they're using broad-based tools that have all of their uh, uh, income, uh, the state's income, generate helping in uh, uh, generate uh, uh, revenue for the state. While Alaska is using the tool that has the largest adverse impact uh, on on the overall economy. So I think there's I think there's lessons to be taken. Lessons to be learned from this ranking. It's not just it's not just let's complain about it that the that the categories are unfair that you know Alaska you know, has, is really good in some areas. It's just that we're bad in some others. Um, it I think there's a lesson that we can learn here that that you don't use the tool that has the largest adverse impact on your overall economy as your fiscal tool, and that it's not the death knell. That, that some seem to argue it is to use an income tax uh, to, to raise revenue for the things that underpin being successful, uh, have, having a successful, uh, successful economy. Well, and let me counterpoint here on something, too, because this article goes into uh, some details as to why they ranked it the way that they did. Uh, and at one point, they, you know, they talk all about Alaska and its expensive state and all these other things and broadband and Internet. But then it comes down to uh, then it comes down to the governor and immediately starts hitting on the governor for vetoing 200 million in state spending, uh, vetoing money from the highway, the uh, Alaska Marine Highway. And then says he relentlessly slashed the university with a cuts totaling seventy million. This hurts the state's ranking in education. Nowhere in there do they talk about the size and scope of government and the per capita spend in the state of Alaska. This article completely ignores the whole revenue versus expenditure article. And I know you and I have beat that horse to death, and you're of the opinion that it, you know, nothing will ever come of that because there's no political will, to which I'm I mean, I'm starting to agree with you on that there is no political will, it seems, to cut the size and but nobody's even addressing it. This article is actually a pretty good article, except when it comes down to here, because it does not talk about the revenues and expenditures and why the gov they make it sound like the gov 
governor just wanted to get in there with a hatchet and start hacking stuff out. And that's it. It doesn't talk about the fact that we're spending more money than we've taken and we've done it for years Nobody's talking about that or the size and scope or the per capita spend, all of which would be great indicators of what's, you know, what's the per capita spend in Utah? What's the per capita spend in these, you know, the other states that you just mentioned? You know, how much as a comparative uh, is it in that? Yep. And and you're absolutely right about that. And frankly, that's what you and I talked about from 20, well, when, whenever we started this, 2013 or 2014. We've talked about that. We've talked about that since the beginning, and I absolutely agree that that is a criteria uh, that contributes to Alaska's problem. But we've we in 2019, the governor tried to address that, and and there weren't even 16 in the legislature that would back him up on the depth of vetoes that that he proposed uh, to get us uh, to get us somewhere back toward. Uh, 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 balance. Now, frankly, given what's happened to oil prices since, even those vetoes wouldn't have gotten us gotten us back to balance. But but there weren't even 16 to back him up on the full length of the vetoes. Now there were 16 ultimately who backed him up on some vetoes, but there weren't 16 who backed him up on the full uh, the full set uh, of vetoes. So uh, you know, yes, we can we can talk about that, we can complain about it, but the problem, Michael, to me is. If we focus entirely on that, we're just going down a dead end road because we're not getting a legislature uh, that that is going to back up the level of cuts it takes to do that. We're going to continue to have a legislature like Sarah Rasmussen, who says, you know, oh, I'm I'm for cuts, but I just don't want to make cuts like that. Uh, and and we're we're we've got a legislature that's got 60 members, each of which has got a pet project they don't want want cut. And when you add all that up, uh, it, it it totals a government that's bigger than uh, than than what we can afford based on traditional revenues. If we just keep going down that road and don't address the revenue side, what happens is what's happened for the last six years. They use PFD cuts uh, to backfill uh, into uh, uh, into that into that revenue need. We've got to focus. I, I, I know it's not a popular thing to say on this show, but we've got to focus on the revenue side. Continuing to pl- complain about the cost side is good. It's right. It's one of the issues that has to be addressed, uh, but it hasn't been addressed fully. It's not going to be addressed fully. Um, and, and you know, just continuing to focus all of our energy on that and letting the revenue side go just results in continued PFD cuts. The abs, the worst, <laughs> the the worst fiscal tool we can use, the t- fiscal tool with the largest adverse impact, and and frankly, you know, if we just keep going down that road and keep using the fiscal tool with the largest adverse impact, we just we just keep but uh, we, we we keep bouncing around between 47 and 50. Right. Uh, we have got to get back on track on the revenue side, and as, and as you and I have talked, if you have a broad-based tax, that. Uh, 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 it gives all Alaska families a stake in the game, including the top 20%, I think you're going to see a pushback on spending that we haven't been now. Sarah Rasmussen is is responding to the top 20% in her district. They say, we don't want an income tax. And, and the result of that is they have no stake in the game because they're not paying for government. That's all being pushed off on middle and lower income Alaska families through the use of PFD cuts. You use an approach that, 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 brings in the top 20 percent that gives them a stake in the game gives them a reason to be involved in pushing back on spending and i think you're going to get a different result and of course uh this is you know this is uh this is the part of the argument that comes down to to say this is what that was jay hammond's argument by the way that Alaskans needed it. He he fought against the reduction of the income tax. He said, turn it to zero. Don't take it off the books because unless Alaskans are engaged and they all feel that, then they will be disconnected from it. Now, some would argue that same argument could be applied to the federal income tax and look at where we are today. But I mean, I, you know, I don't know at this point. Well, no, the, the, yeah, the federal income tax is is the opposite problem. PFD cuts shove costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. The federal income tax shoves it all to, to upper income, uh, uh, upper middle and 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 top 20 percent uh, families and leaves the, the bottom 60 percent unengaged and pushing for more and more and more because they don't have to pay for it. That's why I think a flat tax, that's why I've advocated a flat tax 
because I think a flat tax engages all uh, uh, Alaska families, uh, no exemptions, no deductions uh, uh, based on AGI. I think a flat tax uh, engages all Alaska families in the effort to push back on on government costs. So, yeah, I I, I agree. The federal income tax you, using a, using income tax at the federal level is not has not not slowed down spending. But I think I think that frankly just it is just another example of when you push costs on one income bracket, be it up the upper income brackets or the lower income brackets, and let another income bracket off the hook. You don't get the incentives to uh, to push back on costs. Only when you uh, only when you engage everybody, and 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 you know you look at Utah, or you look at North Carolina that have flat taxes. They do have lower uh, costs of government because I would argue because you've engaged their population uh, in pushing back on costs. As long as you let somebody escape, as long as you have an income bracket that does that's not in, that doesn't have to worry about the cost of government, you're going to continue to get uh, results like like we get at the federal level and we've gotten here. You get a lot of shade in the chat room, Brad. Just a lot of shade in the Brad chat room. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't doubt it, Michael. I, I know it's not a popular position, but, no. we're, we're, but we're 50th. I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I mean, I know. I mean, come on, there's a reason we're 50th. I got you know, and... Uh, uh, Brad's argument on including the top 20 can be used with sales tax on the poorest, which would affect the dimwits in western Alaska to the point of getting unelected. And Willie's argument, I think, is one of the reasons why Brad has, you know, why you push back so much on a sales tax, because, again, it's regressive and it affects disproportionately affects the lowest income earners as well. I mean, that's I think I, you would agree with with Willie's argument on that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, sales tax, sales tax is 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 worse than uh than an income tax flat income tax uh, uh because it does uh tilt against middle and lower income alaska families but it's better than pfd cuts i mean i i i i i, I want the governor to come out with a revenue proposal most have said he's going to come out with sales taxes i'm going to push back against that but even if i lose that battle even if we end up with a sales tax we're better off than we are with pfd cuts pfd cuts if you look, at, and, and we'll look at it in the third segment with Natasha, but PFD cuts are just, tar you can just clearly see the targeting at middle and lower income Alaska families. It's just like a laser targeted uh, at, at those. At least sales taxes are a little bit broader, uh, a little bit less targeted than, uh, than PFD cuts. I have a bone to pick here uh, in the chat room because um, I've seen this comment a couple times from Barbara. And, uh, you know, where she says, oh, you, you, you tax, tax, tax. He's like, he's a paid lobbyist. And let me just say this, Barbara, this is Brad doesn't even have to defend himself on this. Brad and I have been talking about this since late, mid to late 2014. We've been talking about these issues and we've talked for the first five years, six, six years. We talked exclusively about how the state need to get their spending house in order. And it was only late 19, 20, 21, early, somewhere in the last two years that Brad has started talking almost exclusively about taxes because he has been, we've been pushing this. He's not paid to do this. He is concerned about what's going on. And so I'm just going to take a, I'm just going to take, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take exception with that. He's not being paid to do this. He's trying, struggling uh, and Brad and like I said, Brad and I have known each other for almost ten years now. He's been trying and struggling to fight alongside me and others to bring the Alaska's uh, budget back on track. And you know, he gave up on the one side because obviously you could be Don Quixote all you want, but uh, you know, when your mule starts throwing you to the ground and stomping on you, you got to figure out another thing to do. And that's kind of the way we're going right now. Um, yeah, I, I was. I would only add to that this: don't talk to me. I mean, talk to Sarah Rasmussen. Talk to the Talk to the, the 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 Republicans in the legislature, the so-called you know claim to be fiscal conservatives in the legislature that you know disappear when it comes time to back up the governor on the on the on the 2019 levels. We and 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 you know we we are being taxed. This is not a question of taxes or not. We've been taxed the last six years. That's what PFD cuts are. They're taxes. They're 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 the diversion of revenue otherwise intended for the private sector to government that's exact that's the economic 
definition, classic economic definition of a tax, diver, diversion of private sector income to government. So we are being taxed. The question is, and 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 it's not going to end. You talk to Sarah Rasmussen and the others, they're going to tell you it's not going to end. Uh, it's not going to end. So the question is, what's the right tax? What's the best tax? What gets us away from using the tax that has the largest adverse impact on the economy? And that's, you know, and that's why we talk about other taxes other than the PFD, because they're better for the economy than, than the road we've been going down. But I think Brad just made a very valid point. The fact is, is that we are already being taxed with our permanent fund. And if you consent, if you continue to just, you know, hammer down on the cuts argument, which I'm a full supporter of, but if that's all you do, then you are advocating for PFD taxes. That's my position at this point. If all you do is say, we're going to cut, we need to cut, we need to cut, we're going to cut then you're advocating for them to continue to tax you the way that they have been, which is with the taking of the PFD. The pain has got to be spread. The pain has got to, we are already being taxed out of existence. And if all we do is keep arguing the same thing, we're going to get the same results, which is nothing at this point. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Uh, we're moving on to number two. Give me a 60-second uh, teaser here for number two, Brad, as we move into the break. Well, we're going to talk about power cost equalization, uh, which is uh, which is now a, a, a topic heightened both by the uh, the, the reverse sweep uh, and by uh, the latest lawsuit. Um, there's an article that people have been pointing to in the ADN, an op-ed piece. Uh, this titled "Power Cost Equalization" is about far is about far more than money, uh, and arguing for restoring uh, the PCE. Every paragraph of that, if you just substitute PFD for PCE, uh, it's, it's exactly the same reasoning why you should be concerned about the, PF, uh, about the PFD uh, and the P PCE in the same breath. Um, and we'll talk about that. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing right now. Brad Keithley, our guest, the weekly top three. We were on to number two, which is the PFD and the PCE share some things. They have some interesting similarities. Brad, uh, dive into this with us here. Well, uh, there's been uh, a lot of debate over the PCE. There was an op-ed over the weekend uh, in the uh, ADN uh, titled Power Cost Equalization is about far more than money. Uh, it was by, it, The op-ed is by the head of um, AVEC, the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative, uh, the, the, the entity that um, is responsible for generating and providing power. Uh, in the rural part of the state. Uh, that op-ed was then hyped by Bryce Edgeman in a post on Facebook talking about how this is this uh, op-ed uh, describes exactly why PCE is so important uh, and why PCE needs to be needs to be restored. If you go through the the, the fascinating thing is if you go through uh, this op-ed and and look at the arguments that's being made for PCE, they're exactly the same type of arguments. Uh, that support uh, the PFD. The argument for PCE is there needs to, that that it exists to create regional balance between the cost of the cost of electricity in the urban areas in the rail belt uh, and the cost of electricity, the much higher cost of electricity uh, out in the rural areas. And PCE is important to help balance. It doesn't completely balance. Uh, it doesn't completely equate the two, but to help help offset the costs of of power. Uh, out in the rural areas and make them more like uh, like the urban areas. Well, the PFD is is for the purpose of creating balance uh, among Alaska families, among the lower income Alaska families and 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 higher income Alaska families. It is to help offset uh, the high cost of of living in Alaska. It's to help provide a balance, uh, uh, an equitable balance among income brackets. And in doing so, because of the because of the the income levels out in the bush uh, to provide some equity to uh, uh, income equity to families out uh, in the bush as well. Same reasoning, same, you know, if you support PCE, you should support the, should support the PFD on that issue. The second one is that uh, uh, PCE is, is, is there to provide an offset, um, uh, another investment, another tool, if you will, to help balance uh, the bush. Uh, against er, against the rail belt because the rail belt has been the beneficiary uh, of a lot of state investment. Uh, 
the, the fact that we don't have the fact that we have royalty and tax relief uh, in the Cook Inlet so that the price of gas uh, into South Central uh, is held low. The fact that the state's invested in hydro resources uh, in various places that provides low cost energy uh, into uh, into the rail belt area. Uh, that this is that the PCE is a is an investment tool similar to investing in to what's happened for the benefit of the rail belt, right? Uh, in terms of investing in these higher hydro hydropower projects, or investing in, uh, uh, in investing through not collecting uh, taxes uh, on Cook Inlet uh, gas production. That this is this is the equivalent sort of the argument is made the that equivalent was- of building a hydroelectric that was the theory that was the the theory the execution turned out to be something completely different right and so and so the pfd is the same thing the pfd is you know to to if you read hammond hammond goes on and on and on about about state money being directed state general funds being directed to special interests that the legislature focuses on on special interests that the pfd is to help offset that by putting money in Ala- in ordinary alaska families hands to offset the money that's being directed to special interests so the 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 rationale behind the pce is the same as the rationalization behind the pfd and i cannot understand people who say oh we've got to protect pce who don't at the same time for this very same reasons say oh we've got to protect the pfd Exactly. And now, of course, the lawsuit that just came out basically says, oh, you can't do that. The actions of the legislature allowed the, you know, I mean, they, they you can't do that. The governor, this this new argument and, and this uh, a lawsuit against the governor is because he decided in 2019 to change how it's accounted for. And you can't, which is exactly, of course, what happened with the permanent fund dividend. It used to be a transfer and the Walker administration changed how they accounted for it in the budget. And uh, and and so now it's they're like they're trying to make this. Well, you can't do that. That doesn't you know. Uh, and to me, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, it is, it is the same thing in the sense that that the governor Governor Walker changed direction on how you account for the PFD. Governor Dunleavy's changes changed direction on how you account for the PCE. Both of those are changes. Just because it's a change doesn't mean that that is somehow unlawful. There is a a, a different. A difference in the legal issue that will confront the court on the PCE. The question in the PCE is whether it falls the, the PCE falls within the within the sweep provisions uh, of the of, uh, of Article Nine, Section Seventeen, Subsection D of the Constitution, which is that which is the article that governs the uh, the reverse sweep. And that wasn't the issue with respect to the PFD. The issue with respect to the PFD is whether somehow <coughs> in the creation of the permanent fund and the permanent fund statute, the uh, the PFD had been separate had been separated out from uh, the dedicated fund. So there's right. going to be a different legal issue involved in dealing with uh, with the reverse uh, reverse sweep issue. But the fundamental argument about, oh, the governor can't change policy because it's been the policy all along. It's exactly the same issue uh, as uh, as with Walker and and the court said, sure, you can. Uh, you can do that. You can do that because the Constitution permits it. The question here is going to be, does the Constitution require uh, the reverse sweep? I think the outcome of the suit, frankly, is going to be likely to make the ERA subject to the reverse sweep. Um, and that's going to be an entirely different thing. I This is. You know, the Wilikowski suit sort of suffered from the law of unintended consequences. Uh, we, we now have constitutional law that says the PFD isn't protected. I think I think this lawsuit may suffer from the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> I, I, we may find out that that not only is the is the is the PCE not protected, but the ERA isn't protected either, and they all come back into the CBR at the end of a session. Right. Be careful what you wish for. Again, I think that the perfect irony here is the same people who are screaming from the rooftops about how this is going to disproportionately affect rural Alaska should be the same people that are beating the drum just as hard for a full PFD. But, uh, you know, again, that, that's the <laughs> Yeah, ir- the only— the only way you rationalize Bryce's, you know, Bryce who's been a PFD cutter and Bryce who's protecting the PSE, PCE, is the PCE is is a state program that was built up by legislators that they claim credit for. 
The PFD, on the other hand, is some is is something that they're not that, that they can't claim credit for. It's not an appropriation. It's not a right. it's not a a, a a personal thing that they can claim credit for. Right. Uh, let's move on to number three here. We got about four minutes, and that is Natasha's Aurora plan, uh, which you say has got some. There's some interesting things going on here. It's all summed up in one chart. Yeah. Uh, so Natasha's Aurora plan uh, has sort of resurfaced because she did a presentation on it last week, uh, last Friday to Commonwealth North, and did a power PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation that that uh, that she said was justified the Aurora plan. The Aurora plan, for those who aren't up to date on it, is is basically the same thing that uh, that other legislators have proposed. It is to take the take the the POMV draw, put it entirely to government. And take a small chunk out, uh, and and make a new PFD that would re create a new PFD that would result in about a $500 PFD, uh, as opposed to the $3,000 PFD under the under the current statute. It's uh, it, it's just a it's another way of cutting the PFD, but it's a she she calls it a plan. There's one slide missing uh, in her plan that we posted uh, uh, yesterday. When, when in any other state, and certainly at the federal level, when you propose a new fiscal plan, you include with it a distributional analysis. How is it going to affect uh, Alaska families at or families at different at different uh, income brackets, um, and how's the distribution uh, of that among income brackets? She didn't include it. She didn't include a distributional analysis in her. Uh, in, in her presentation, unlike what happens in uh, every other state and at the federal level. So we threw one up um, uh, on our Facebook page, uh, and that I think tells the entire story. If you look, if you compare her approach of cutting the PFD as a way of funding a government versus an income tax uh, as a way of funding government, either a progressive income tax or a flat income tax, what you see immediately is that PFD cuts impact and this is what i was talking about targeting earlier what you see immediately is that pfd cuts take the most from middle and lower income alaska families uh, and 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 that's 80 percent of alaska families middle and lower income alaska families is 80 percent of alaska take pfd cuts take the most from from 80 percent of alaska families the wealthiest 20 percent get off much much lighter and the top one percent the chart i posted breaks down the top 20% into 15, five and one, 15, four and one. The top 1% pays l less than anybody using PFD cuts. Right. So if you if you want an understanding of what Aurora is doing, look at that chart. It tells you exactly what's going on uh, and who's paying, who, who pays the bill as a result of going down the Aurora. And, ju and just for those of you who can't see it at home, because I've got it up on the screen, the lowest 20% uh, with the permanent fund dividend cuts pays 7.2% versus the upper 1% paying 0.2%. So yeah, that's just a, that's just a, a, a complete, it's definitely a complete idea. Uh, to look at. Barbara says, I totally disagree with the proposal, but the income distribution is not the basis of fiscal. I don't think, Brad, you're not arguing that this is the basis of fiscal policy, but it at least needs to be looked at as you decide what's going on. Oh, it's a hugely important aspect of fiscal policy. I mean, you, you decide fiscal policy for a number of reasons. You decide on a, on a given fiscal policy for a number of reasons. One of those certainly is uh, the distributional effect, because the distributional effect, and we've seen this with the PFD cut, the distributional effect uh, uh, governs or, or controls the economic consequence of it. If you take money out of the hands of middle and, in and lower income Alaska families, those are the ones that spend the marginal dollar. You put a dollar in their hands, it's going to be spent. You put a dollar in the hands of the top 20, it's going to be saved or invested someplace. It's not going to circulate through the economy. You put a marginal dollar in the hands of the middle and lower income families, and they spend that dollar. So, so how it, how you how the distributional impact of of a fiscal approach uh, uh, directly translates into the economic impact. Uh, of of a fiscal approach, so di the distributional impact is is more than about equity. It's about uh, it's also about uh, economic impact, and it, it is one of the key considerations. Not the only one, but it certainly is one of the key considerations when you're determining a fiscal plan. Um, 
Uh, she isn't doing her job if she doesn't want to see how it will affect Alaskan, says John, and I think you're talking about Natasha. But again, all of her policies that I've watched in the last few years have all been disconnected from, from how it affects Alaskans. It more importantly seems to be how it affects her and her donor class at this point. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I mean, just look at this. You look at this distribution chart, um, and for those who you know ha aren't able to see it on the screen, you, you look at it uh, on on our website or on our Facebook page. You look at the dis distribution chart, and and it's not, it, it, it can't be more clear what's going on. It's all to save the top twenty percent. It's all to push the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. That's the driver. Uh, in in this uh, in this fiscal plan, it certainly, and Natasha pays zero point. Well, she actually pays less because within the one percent, you then break it down further, right. and 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 the more income, the lower the percent you're paying. Right, right. Well, and that's exactly it. But if you look at this number and you see, I'll pull the screen back. I'll pull it back up on the screen right here, and you see top twenty percent point or pop top one percent point two. The top, uh, uh, the top, t uh, uh, fifteen percent still pays only one point one percent. They're at least kind of close to the equitability factor there. But I mean, come on, seriously, point two percent for the wealthiest individuals versus seven point two percent for the lowest income. That means yeah. And Michael, one thing about this chart is it's 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 a five hundred million five hundred million dollar increment. So if your if your deficit is is a billion. That's double these increments. So instead of 7.2, it's 14% if you're trying to close a billion dollars through PFD cuts, which is what we're doing uh, this fiscal year. So it's um, these, num these numbers are bad enough, but when you scale them to the level of PFD cuts that we're experiencing, they get horrendous uh, in terms of what they're doing to the to middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, I think this comes back to and I and I know, again, we're you know, the, the listeners are very uptight about this because, again, they just want to see a discussion on they just want to see a discussion on cuts. But I mean, to that, I would just say this. How's that working out for us? I have been on the cuts bandwagon since 1999, 1999, and I have seen no substantive cuts in the budget for the last 23 years. And so have we changed out some of the players? Yes. Did we change out enough? No. Are we going to change them all out? Man, some of these constituencies love their people. I mean, Bert Stedman keeps going back. You know, Louise Stutes keeps going back. Gary Stevens keeps going back. You know, Bryce Edgman keeps going back. I mean, we're going to have a very hard time changing out some of the players in there. There are some that are, that are susceptible that I've talked about, but it's going to be very tough to change out all the players to, that that are going to need to make this happen, and so unless we have these discussions on what is the best of the worst case scenarios, we're going to get our asses kicked continuously. Yeah, it's I, I mean the the top twenty percent is just laughing all the way to the bank. Sometimes sometimes I'm convinced that there are that there that the top twenty percent wants to keep directing the conversation about cuts because they know cuts are never going to happen but they know it diverts people who otherwise would be concerned about the distributional impact. It's like, you know, you get a, you get, you get a discussion going and somebody from the top 20% goes, Oh, but what about cuts? And then everybody runs, you know, and, and, and talks about cuts. And all of a sudden we forget about, you know, revenue equality or, or, or revenue uh, equity. It's they're, they're laughing. Believe me, believe me, they're laughing all the way to the bank. As 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 you know, the the people out here continue to, you know, f fixate on cuts and don't address the revenue issue. They're fine with that. You know, they'll take that every day because every day that goes on, every day we're not ad addressing revenue equality or revenue equity. Every day that goes on. They are are running to the bank because we're continuing to use PFD. Cuts. Well, and I'll and I'll make the same argument I made a few minutes ago that if all you continue to do is fixate on the cuts, and I'm not saying stop arguing for the cuts, but I'm saying you have to make it a multi prong approach. If all you do though is just stand on your hill and stamp your foot and say cuts only, uh, you are advocating for a continuation of a taxation through the PFD. That's that's it, because we are being taxed right now. 
and you could shout all you want, but unless we find a way to make it a more equitable situation, it's just going to kill us even more. Brad, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you being part of it today. Uh, we love having Mike, you on the program. Michael, as always, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.